like to go ahead and get us started here. My name is Stephanie Brooke. I work with Capella University. Um, I have my MS degree in counseling and my PhD in psychology. Over 25 years teaching experience and, and much of that, my later part of the career is, is focused on working in the doctoral space and teaching online. So I feel pretty grateful. I've been mentoring for 10 years and so it's just telling Corey, I just had my 27th PhD graduate in counseling. So I was really excited about that. Um, I am a published author. I've written and edited several books, mostly in the field of art and creative therapy. Um, Tools of the Trade is the one that's internationally known. Um, so I, I enjoyed especially writing um, critical test reviews and that sort. So when there was a gap in the literature in terms of art therapy assessments, I was able to, to see that and address it. So welcome to those of you who are here and to all of you that'll be joining us later. I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Now the, the purpose of this presentation really is to delve into the transactional distance theory. And I just wanna give you a little backdrop. When um, everything changed last year due to the health pandemic and all the restrictions related to COVID, it um, tremendously impacted our work, even teaching online in terms of how we were gonna deal with residency learners Thankfully, it didn't impact the uh, regular mentees as much, but the residency learners were impacted and their work with um, participants for their study was dramatically impacted. So I became very concerned of what can I do to best support them in, in this time? Because everybody was facing very dramatic changes at work, at home. And for those of you um, that were continuing education, there were um, a lot of dramatic changes to deal with. So this is really what got me interested in looking at Moore's transactional distance theory because I wanted to do everything that I could to minimize the pain points um, that, that the learners were experiencing as they were trying to adjust to these changes. So we'll, we'll take a look at um, transactional distance, where did it start? How is it measured? Um, I'll also take a look at the strengths and limitations of this theory. Um, in dissertation work, theory is often used as a platform for dissertations to either support the analysis of the problem under study or the phenomenon. So I always tell my mentees, know the strengths and, and limitations of the theory that you're using. So I tried to do the same here in practice. So um, we'll look at some of the research associated with it, what they're finding, practical applications. And then I was hoping we could create a little bit of a dialogue at the end over the strategies for reducing and preventing transactional distance. Um, and I'll start off, I have a good list that things I developed and refined over time, but I definitely added to over the, the last few years. So you might ask, you know, why, why this theory? Why is it important for, for counselors, psychologists to know about? Um, and I think it's really critical, especially for those faculty that are teaching and mentoring online um, they face a lot of difficulties in terms of the multiple roles that they're taking, um, you know, course designer, course instructor, mentoring, that sort of thing. So they need that support in terms of reducing the, even the distance they're feeling within their own community online and the university. But really, you know, for my purposes, I delved into this because I wanted to help learners. And we already know from the research that, you know, the, the lower the perceived transactional distance, the higher the learner satisfaction. And that's what I'm, I'm going for, because I tried to be very learner centered and respond to those needs over time. So um, I'm hoping that just this brief overview will give you some tools, but what I'm really thinking is that you're gonna see this theory used as a lens for lots of dissertation studies, not just in our field 
of psychology and counseling, but you're, I think it's going to bridge over into other industries as they've had to adapt and try and deal with this distance um, factor within the last year due to COVID restrictions. So um, let me just give you a little bit of information. Um, Dr. Michael Graham Moore is a professor emeritus of education at Penn State University. He is also the founder of the American Journal of Distance Education. So this theory that I'm presenting really is the seminal theory that was used to guide distance education programs and later online programs. But it started in 1972 and the theory evolved from basic insights regarding independent learning and learner autonomy. So the, it was developed into a, a multidimensional set of interrelated definitions and constructs that he called the theory of transactional distance. Um, it was, like I said, it was developed in 72 in response to the, the beginning of these distance education programs. So it's pedagogical um, and looking at the analysis of, of teaching and learning um, and doing that through technology. So there was, you know, through this movement away from face-to-face -face learning, this is where his seminal theory of, of distance education evolved. Um, and it's been widely used in research since the inception and continues to, to be cited worldwide, actually. I've read studies um, where they're using it as a lens in Malaysia, Greece, um, um, worldwide. So it, that part is interesting and it has that global um, interest in terms of using it as a lens. So just to quickly go over um, in terms of what is this transactional distance and he really did conceptualize it as the interaction between the teacher and the student or learner. I'll probably use those terms interchangeably here, but Cap Capella typically refers to um, students as learners. So um, transactional distance for Moore was really interdependent on the interaction of dialogue, structure, and learner autonomy. And I'll go into detail about those, but Really the dialogue is any type of interaction between um, teachers and learners. And the structure that he's talking about really gets into the elements of course design. How is the program offered? How is it structured? And the last one is learner autonomy where the, you know, the students share responsibility for their own learning process. And that's very typical in adult education. Um, he states a dialogue and structure are more qualitative variables. So this kind of presents the crux in trying to test this theory. So some of it has been tested um, empirically with, with some results and, and some are mixed primarily due to definitions here. Um, but he felt that distance education programs really do not give enough attention to the structure. So um, he wanted to delve into that a little bit more and look at the communication that's really taking place here between the instructor and the learner. So here again, it really emanated from the perceived needs and desires of adult learners. Um, so really when you look at that, um, it, it's, it's an interplay of all of these factors. So, the amounts, um, I wanna take a look at the linear relationships of this in the next slide, but just go over in detail a little bit more about the, the dialogue. And I noticed in the literature, um, when they were trying to quantify dialogue, they were trying to do it in the amount um, and frequency. And that sometimes doesn't give you enough information. I've had really short and sweet email communications with learners and, um, you know, more frequent ones at that, but then I've had more extensive ones. So I don't know, I don't know that it really considers the quality of that dialogue. So um, to continue on here, structure really is how rigid or how flexible is the program. 
and even looking at Capella University and, and changes over time since I first started there, they're offering the flex path, which is a less structured path for learners to still complete their dissertation milestones. Um, but that's the type of, of structure that he's talking about. And then you have learner autonomy and that variable is always very different and dependent on the, on the learner. So um, moving on to the next slide here, this is kind of a, a three-dimensional depiction of the transactional distance model. And I always like looking at graphics of theories, particularly when I'm working in mentoring, because it really helps analyze the, the problem that they're looking at in more detail and helps with guiding interview questions. But transactional distance is inversely proportional to the development of dialogue between teachers and learners. And it's proportional to the structure of the course and the student's level of autonomy. So he thought there was three types of transactional distance. First, the transactional distance between the students and the teachers. That's more of the psychological and commutative space and perceptions and misperceptions that occur within that space. Then you have the transactional distance between um, students themselves, um, their peers, how well connected are they? Then the transactional distance between the student and the program content. So um, dialogue structure and our learner autonomy really are, are critical in, in terms of this learning and student outcomes. Um, he states that dialogue and structure, um, again, are more qualitative, but that you can still measure transactional distance. And some people have attempted to do that, which I'll share later. Um, let me just continue on here. Here's a good quote I just wanted to share with you. He stated that um, transactional distance is the gap of understanding and communication between teachers and learners caused by geographic distance that must be bridged through distinctive procedures in instructional design and facilitation of interaction. So it kind of presents the theory here in, in just a nutshell. But um, the one thing I notice is that he's really drawing linear relationships bet between these three variables. And sometimes I'm not sure it always works that way. Um, they have, since this theory was developed, they have uh, about four different types of assessments. So for those of you that are, are interested in the quantitative side of it, this is a great place to start. It's not exhaustive, but it'll get you in the right direction. Um, Zing's scale of transactional distance was one of the first ones that I came um, across, but um, it was based solely on uh, Moore's theory and measures transactional distance between the student and these different factors between content, instructor, and other students. And it really, was correlated with student satisfaction. So they demonstrated um, reliability and validity evidence. Um, the same is true for some of the others. Now there again, you'd have to look at the, the tease out the individual um, measurement evidence aspects. This is very general um, uh, statements of reliability and validity. So this is something I always have my mentees kind of tease out. If there's a limitation in reliability, where is it is, where's the limitation in validity? So hopefully this um, will get you started in, in terms of measuring, actually measuring um, the transactional distance. But what I'm seeing even in the research so far, um, tends to be there, there's more interest within the last year or so of a qualitative nature and qualitative focus on this particular issue. So what are some of the strengths of, of, that I see with this theory? And the biggest one, it, it's continued um, use over the span of time that it was developed in the 70s. I mean, the research really popped in the 90s and that's where you started seeing some assessment development but um 
it has been used in so many um, distance education programs as a guideline, you know, really to check the quality of the program that they were offering. Um, it guides the structure and continued improvement of distance education programs and proposes that the, the essential distance and distance education is more transactional. That's where his theory is different. It's not just, initially I think it was more geographical in how he presented it, but that changed. It's more the transaction, not the spatial or temporal location and helps to focus on um, how do we, as a university, as instructors, how do we help to reduce this perception these misunderstandings that occur in that transactional distance space. How can we, how can we minimize or prevent those? Um, and there again, I think one of the reasons I really looked into this too is the high, higher student satisfaction when um, there's you know, less perceived transactional distance. So we have a lot of advances in our communication technology today that we're not there when he first originated this theory. We have synchronous and asynchronous communications that really, you know, um, I think embellish the interaction and really promote the interaction between uh, teacher and learner, even if they are in, in an online program. Um, so really transaction, as Moore sees it, is at the core of distance education and kind of, you know, helps to look at some of the mechanisms that are involved in that. Um, he, Moore's theory has garnered great support from Keegan, the founder of the Journal of Distance Education, and Rumble, who's a specialist in dis uh, distance education and administration. So Keegan felt that Moore's theory really is the, the defining concept of, of distance education, while, you know, Rumble really looked at the phrase of transactional distance and really looked at that as a core reason, a core problem for universities to address in terms of helping learners achieve their goals. There are limitations um, with this theory. Um, for instance, if you read the empirical literature, particularly the quantitative studies, um, Moore did not operationalize his definitions of autonomy, structure, and dialogue. So when the researchers tried to do that, they all had varied definitions of these same variables. So that makes comparison of those studies a little bit mixed. Um, the relationships are not always predictive and construct validity evidence was weak. And that's still probably a challenge today. So um, in terms of what I see for this theory, I think it has, has great support, but the last two limitations are what I notice. Um, I had a mentee who wanted to use transactional distance theory, but I, I felt it was limited in how she wanted to use it in her work. So what we did, we ended up pairing a systems theory, Bronfenbrenner systems theory combined with this one to really expand it. Um, I also noticed a limitation of the theory in terms of the cultural context. Um, even the research, if you look at the research with this, they, they did get into gender a little bit, gender differences in terms of perceived transactional distance, but it hasn't really looked at the, the cultural context. And what does that cultural context look like in the university? And, there are so many other elements that even students and teachers bring to that environment. What is that cultural context like? So um, just to give you some um, examples here, there are different themes, um, terms used. Like if you look at the literature, you'll see variables, clusters, and dimensions, and they're kind of used interchangeably. Um, the one problem I saw in terms of the linear relationship is that, um, you know, they say, you know, learner autonomy is really required and it's kind of squelched when you have high structure. And I don't necessarily see that. And the only example I can think of is with residency learners who need a high degree of structure in order to really get their, their um, dissertation plan off the ground they also require um, a lot of dialogue 
so those are some instances I feel it was a little bit limited. I don't think it's necessarily a linear relationship all the time. And it really will dep depend on the content. If I have highly autonomous learners, we'll do really, really well in a counseling class, but then um, not as much in a residency class, which is challenging in and of itself. So Dr. Really Brooke, I just wanted to, oh. sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, we're stuck on the first slide. Oh, geez. Oh, nobody <laughs> told me that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, let it's me okay. see. How I, what are you seeing right now? Now we can see it. Okay. I apologize for that, guys. That was no fun. <laughs> That's um, okay. Just wanted yeah, thanks for doing that. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I think this is the area really where I wanted to spend a little bit of time and just chat with you about, and that's how do we manage transactional distance? And um, the one thing that I did differently, it's like, well, what did you really do differently if you were already teaching online? And what I did is I held a lot more um, informal group meetings more synchronous meetings to provide that support. I varied the times. I didn't make it a requirement, but it was there if they wanted that additional support. And what I tried to do is just promote that, that social gap. And as a creative idea, what I thought I would try to for my tests and measurements class is really um, trying to use the gaming app Jeopardy to cover some of the content, but you know, make studying for their, for their quiz fun. So just offering more opportunities for them to get together um, with me, but also encouraging them to start their own coffee clutch or support groups. So um, people didn't feel as isolated when all of that was going on. And, you know, I try to foster a community of learning culture, trying to connect them to LinkedIn, for instance, um, looking for dissertation support groups. That's always helpful. And then just having Socratic dialogues and important discussions, we had to talk about changes that were going on, not only with how they were gonna do their research, but what was happening at home and work and how is this gonna impact their, their educational plan? So I had some self-paced learning activities that I included and I keep adding to that. Actually, I was doing that today before, before this presentation where I will create videos for them try and keep it short, you know, less than 10 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, but um, important building blocks of content that they need to master. And they can do that at their own pace, go back and look at it as often as they want um, or ask me questions about it. So I took a lot more time to break down content into these short little video clips where they get to see me, which they say they like that feedback. It feels like having that interaction. And that's what they do in between our meetings is take a look at those. So it keeps that continuous thread and connection. Um, in terms of setting manageable tasks and progress reports, just to keep motivation up, I probably was checking in quite a bit more in terms of if, you know, workload and so forth, but the learner really needs to take initiative too to share with you, you know, um, the, the work tasks are just too much this week. I need to make some adjustments in, in terms of my planning. Um, personalized feedback. I always did this probably, but more of a strength-based focus to help them bridge any learning gaps. And I find that those little video clips that I've done really do help with that. Um, continually providing connections to resources. Um, I had a lot more <clears throat> Pardon me, everybody. I have a lot more resources for mental health issues, COVID um, crisis concerns, research concerns. So um, I always made sure that they had some place to go if I wasn't personally able to help them with what was going on. Um, and a key difference too, this is something that I tried to create a thread with through all of my mentoring classes, creating a buddy system. So they have support with one another and give them a place and space online to actually do that. So um, in, in a nutshell, you know, what we're seeing in terms, I think we're gonna see this theory used quite a bit more for looking at distance education and counseling and psychology, but I think it's gonna thread over into other industries. Um, 
They still need to have additional reliability and validity evidence for this. I'd like to see them strengthen the construct validity evidence. Uh, but we have a great start on the assessments here that have been proven reliable and valid, maybe not perfect, but a great place to start dissertation research for or anybody who's interested in capturing the, the quantitative side of this. Um, I see a lot more expansion on qualitative research, but I, I would recommend phenomenological studies are really needed of this to capture um, diversity issues, gender issues, hearing the voice of that population that truly is impacted by this transactional distance and what their unique experience is like. And then um, I'd like to see more of a global focus on this theory so it can be used across different work environments and other industries other than education. So what I thought I'd do, if you can see this again, I probably wouldn't back up here just to open it up for a dialogue in, um, if you'd like to share what you have seen in terms of transactional distance and what's helped in your work. Does anybody have any questions? I just wanted to comment. I think for me, managing this really involves, like the, the transactional distance really involves um, catering feedback and being really personalized with students because, you know, if, if it's, it's easy to get into the, okay, grading, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm getting, giving feedback on skills and it's just, it's easy to get into like, all right, everyone needs this feedback or that, but to personalize it and saying, okay, this person's here developmentally and I'm gonna you know, give them feedback that's very personalized. Students, I just, in my experience, respond very well to that. And it's, and it's clear to them when it's personalized. I think they, they buy into it a little bit more, Corey. And you want them to, you want them to buy into like, okay, I do need to change this and this is the direction I need to go in. So personalizing, yeah, um, I, I do use templates but I, I do, you, you have to shift it. Otherwise um, it, it's received as dryly as it's given. So personalizing, I think helps build that relationship too. So I'm glad you brought that up, Corey. Oh, How about, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, just, you know, go ahead. I'll let others jump. Oh no, I'll take any questions at this point. How about others? You can even do fun things with Zoom. I mean, I didn't mention this on here, but it is still something that I did to try and bridge the transactional distance is I, we would share um, photos that we took. Like for instance, I do a lot of wildlife photography. So I would put that as my virtual background and my learners started getting involved in that. So they'd share their favorite vacations or favorite family photos. And when we we're on Zoom and use that as their background. And it, it's a great place just to start in and build those connections. And then before we jump into our work, um, many of my sessions are, are limited to just 30 minutes. So I've learned to function within that. So you warm up in the first five minutes, get to business and then come to a nice closure. But those little touches like incorporating their family photos, it, it just made all the difference. How about Michael, Nicole, T, any, any other questions for me? Cause I, I apologize, I didn't know the, the slides were not um, changing, but I'm, I'm happy to provide a reference list for this material. I'm planning on presenting this PowerPoint again and tweaking it as I go here, but I'll, I would also like to publish on it because really it was a, a unique experience what we all went through, learners and instructors alike with the changes um, that that pandemic brought. So um, hopefully this theory just provided some tools um, to, to use in your work. So to help bridge that gap, especially as probably most of us are zoomed out <laughs> over time. Yeah, Nicole, go ahead, please. Yeah, so, I, so I'm actually at Capella University too. So it was funny to hear you. I was like, oh, you know, different programs. And um, it is interesting how you were saying those extra steps you took. And it's because I felt that the last couple quarters, I had to do the same thing. I really had to humanize myself and share with them like, hey, this is a struggle and I'm human too. And these are some of the things I'm doing. So doing a lot of modeling. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing it was interesting, 
Um, so, you know, we always get our feedback and we look at it. And one of the feedback was, you know, some learners loved it. They found it so helpful and engaging and supportive and not that, you know, of course, due dates are due dates and they have expectations of, you know, graduate learners and so forth. However, there is this idea too that we understand that some circumstances are beyond control and are willing to work and, you know, around those parameters. But then other learners um, had reached out and said it was overwhelming the support. I just needed to know what I needed to know. Like, how do I get this done? You know, and now as I'm, you know, prepping for this quarter, you know, I was really thinking about that because the idea of that self pace that you had brought in, um, you know, became so much more true because some people had so little time that, you know, hearing from me that I'm human too, (laughs) just was overwhelming for them. You know, they really needed to compartmentalize because they were so stressed beyond belief. So I think also now looking at it is trying to find, um, personally for me and like thinking about what you're sharing, finding ways to connect with learners where they have an option to see this support or also look at something that is more streamlined and I need to do duh, 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 mm-hmm. to get this done. Um, and I know the engagement between learners for some, yeah, it was great because they gain support from each other. But for others, it was, I need to do the bare minimum to get this done in order to even stay in the program. So it was really interesting to kind of Learner see. autonomy of- right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. crazy. You're, I mean, when you were talking, you reminded me of something else that I did, Nicole, and it, I created a special video just on self-care, which I used to kind of mention, be sure to take care of yourself and, and do those practices. But I actually did a, um, a video on it and I shared my practices and what changed for me. And I'm a, I, I'm a certified art therapist, play therapist. And one thing that I did to cope with the craziness of COVID was going back to sidewalk chalk art. So I shared that with them. I said, this is, this is what I got back to, to kind of help with the coping with everything that's going on. And then I shared some of the things that I, that I do, like the mindful meditation helps me, yoga helps me, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. I get it. But just to give them some examples of you know, I get it. It's been a lot, but this is what I'm doing to manage. Here's some other ideas for you to help manage, even though everything was pretty much out of hand in terms of work and home life. It really did go upside down for a lot of people. So, and being understanding, I think is critical. You know, everything starts from a place of empathy. That's how I do my work, understanding where they're coming from and being able to go from there that's, that's the only way to kind of manage all of this. So I think in managing trans, it, transactional distance for me, begin from a place of empathy. Mm. So, but yeah, thanks for sharing that, Nicole. How about, how about Mike or any, anybody else have questions for me? I don't have any questions, but I was, um, just interested. I've never heard of this theory before, so I just want to learn a little bit more about it. Yeah, it, it really is interesting how it was a cornerstone for many um, distance programs and then online learning programs. It, I, I think it's a great starting place. You know, every theory does have its limitations, no doubt about that. But I think what's going to be promising about this, it's going to be revisited in dissertation work. And I think you're going to see this theory used as a lens in, in other disciplines, not just, you know, counseling, psychology, education. It's going to hit other industries, too. So how about some any, any other comments or, or questions in terms of dialogue today? Okay, Mr. Corey, I think that's it for me, unless you guys have anything else. All right, thank you so much. This presentation has been awesome and I appreciate you being flexible with the timing as we've got the link situated.
Yeah, no worries. And thanks for your patient guys um, on, on the slides and so forth. So, so happy to have all of you here. Thanks for chiming in too. It's always nice to meet the people that I'm working with here. So Corey, yeah. thank you for your support and, and everybody for being here today. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.